What's going on, Kelly? Hey, Marky. How you doing hey. tonight? I'm good. Ebony got me like, bring it because Ebony brung it. And so it I'm like, the ghost of Ebony is all around here. Like, <laughs> girl. Because she brought that heat. Then. You know what? Let me tell you this about Ebony. Ebony actually changed the hot seat, right? Um, due to the fact that she showed up instantly, I was thinking that, oh, more people need to hear what's coming out of the hot seat. And so mm -hmm. we've been repurposing the hot seats for our for our blog, right? And for our emails and for our podcast. And so now it's taken on just its own additional world to bring in visibility for everyone mm -hmm. who also participates, which makes it more of a value add. And so we've had the opportunity now to take those because uh, everybody been bringing the heat. Y'all, y'all be lighting my butt up. Um, to the hot seat. And so I don't uh, expect anything less of you, <laughs> Miss Kelly. So uh, I'm ready. You know, I got look, I have my second cup of coffee. And let me say this. I'm only drinking uh, the bullet coffee now. So this has MCT oil. And today I put that carry Irish butter in here. It makes it a little sweeter. And so, yes, because I need all my brain cells on fire. I'm not up on that one. Yeah, it's a call. So if you are doing intermittent fasting or a ketogenic diet is one of the ways to get the healthy fat that you need on that diet. But it also helps the MCT oil, which is I think a coconut oil helps uh, essentially it's brain fuel. So mm -hmm. I have changed as a result of change the intermittent fasting and uh, no carbs. I'm actually getting up earlier. Okay. So it's changing my schedule and my joints feel like my body has stretched like two inches in each direction because they're not tight anymore. OK, so you notice the difference. I physically noticed the difference. And then I'm down 20 pounds since when I came home last year. So mm -hmm. um, and I'm being intentional about it because of my lipedema. And so it is a, a lifestyle change, not a diet. Okay. This is a lifestyle change. I hear that. Good to hear. So everybody just come on over and say hello. Drop us a hi over in the chat. As you can tell behind Kelly, uh, she has her dream it, wish it, do it. And so that is what we are all about this. And she got her million dollar, her million, her seven figure firm sitting over there. Yes, uh, because Danielle, no, because Terry Watson said, Marky, look at Danielle Leslie and everybody else who makes seven figures. They got there flowers so hey kelly yeah time for you to take over all. that's all i'm trying to do you know do it all the fern too the fern too <laughs> baby i ain't mad at you so are we ready i'm ready okay all right here we go like my mama said do your best okay so um right so the other day Carrie and Sheena and I can't remember the other uh, woman's name, but they did a clubhouse and they, it was uh, about transitioning from part time to full time. And I was kind of in and out of it because I had a lot going on. But I wanted to bring this question to you. Um, I'm a dual career agent. So I, I work in education and I also manage a real estate business. And I feel like I have two full time jobs, which really is what it is. And I want to just completely transition and be full-time as an agent. And so my question, is to, question to you is what piece of advice would you give to a real estate agent looking to take the leap and go exclusively full-time? So let me, um, I'm gonna tell you what I did, and, but then I'm gonna tell you what I would have done different. So okay. I was in real estate, came in in 1999. I got burned out. Uh, I came in as a loan originator. And so I got burned out and decided I should go get me a real job. I went and I got a job as a pharmaceutical sales rep at Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. I was in farm sales while I was still a loan originator. That was my side hustle while I earned my real estate license. Okay. I absolutely hated pharmaceutical sales. But there were a couple of things. The number one thing was I was a non or unmarried 
mother. So I needed to continue to take care of Skylar in a mannerism in which he had become accustomed to. And before I came into real estate, I was in the family business. So I was sitting down. I was talking to my mother. I'd done a really good job. I had saved uh, whatever the max was for all. Uh, 401k with matching. So I had money and I went to my mother and I said, Ma, I absolutely hate this job. And my mother told me, she was like, well, you know, you can always go get another job. Quit. Now that's my mama. You know, she, she think I could do anything. I'm like, who just quits their job? Right. But because I had been diligent in my savings, I understood mm-hmm. that I had a backup plan. Okay. Mm-hmm. But I also had a business plan. Mm -hmm. I started to implement the business plan before I quit. So the way it lined up was that I started my company July the 31st, 2003. And I tended to start things on July the 31st because it's my birthday. So that's like my good luck charm. I quit Pfizer Pharmaceuticals on September the 6th. Now, mind you, I wasn't trying to quit at the time that I did quit. The reason I quit was because my manager called me and told me I had to return to the field because I had taken FMLA because my grandfather had Alzheimer's disease while I was building this business. And when she hit me with it, I I didn't take me long. I don't even think it took me 10 minutes. I was like, well, where do I send my letter of resignation? And I don't know if it was email or on the phone, but I could tell she was shocked. Like what? Because she's looking at it. How do you just quit this good job? Good job. And I'm like, because I hate it. And I just came straight into real estate. And I went back to that business plan. And I'll tell you, every single year in real estate, I get scared. Once every single year, I question if this is the dang on right decision, right? But in December of 2003, I had a $24,000 month. And what I did was I thought to myself, it would have taken me through promotions and everything, even though it was a good job, to get where I was would earn $240,000 a year selling real estate, okay? And so to me, you have to take the time to have a solid, bona fide business plan. And I've consistently have uh, created business plans over time, even with the transitions and the pivots that I'm making. Um, There's something about the joy of being able to do what you want to do every single day. And a lot of people will tell people just to, you know, jump and just do it. I'm not going to tell you to do that. Right. I am going to say it's a point that you've saved enough money where you have reached whatever that national average is one year. And to me, if you one year, whatever it is, I don't know what it is, but let's say it's one year. If you got that, if you have a business plan and you've managed to save that amount of money now, to me, you're acting out of fear. To not take the leap, because technically you in the same position, whether you working for somebody or you working for yourself. Right. And, and there is that break even. Right. And so I did just quit. But that was not my intentions. It was when they told me I needed to return to the field. And the thought of going into another doctor's office just made me sick. Like I was not I was not happy. And I could see somebody pressing charges against me for for laying hands like I did not like calling on doctors. Okay. so do you have the business plan and do now? you don't have to answer. Do you have the business plan and do you feel secure with the amount of money you have meeting whatever the national? I don't know if it's six months, 12 months, but no, you I'm not by no means. Do you need 10 years? Right. Because here's the thing. You come in and let's say it's one year. And at the six month mark, you're not making progress towards that one year ago. Um, Whenever that next school cycle, whatever up, you need to be back in the in the school. Okay. Okay. This is not one of the questions I plan, but it's based on this this question. Okay. So when you are like burned out from both and you want to you want to and you can see that okay, this this is the real estate business can supersede this job and education, but you're scared. 
and and I think that's normal. Um, Come on with it, girl. I don't know. I'm just like I'm in a space where I'm just scared. I'm scared, but so, I know so that okay, I'm doing the work consistently. So it's I'm seeing the fruits of that work, but I'm still scared because it's like oh the inventory oh this that. And I'm like oh well what if I get into this bind? I mean I can always get a job, and I just but yeah I'm just scared. That's 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 it. That's what that's what it is. Okay, honestly. So couple of things. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I keep mustard seeds, right? Because mm-hmm. we always got to have the faith of a mustard seed. All mm-hmm. right. Um, the next thing is not only do I have my mustard mustard seeds, I definitely do my daily affirmations. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I do my daily affirmations um, because there is some fear. And let me say this. I'm in the best financial position I've ever been in life. Mm-hmm. And I'm still looking at records every single day trying to shore things up. There is still an an amount of fear. And one of my goals was to always be in a position inside of my marriage that my husband could always afford to take care of me. Okay, but when I got married, I had IRS debt. I have finally paid off all the IRS debt. So I am really in a position that if I wanted to, I could sit here all day and do nothing because Stephen makes enough money to take care of us because I only have a car note. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would still be scared. Right. I would Mm -hmm. I would now I would start counting Stephen's money. Like right now, I don't count Stephen's money, which which is probably he just loves that. Right. I ain't counting his money because I know what he got to pay every month. And I ain't seen no notices. So I'm assuming he's doing what he do. Mm -hmm. I would think that some amount of fear. Would always be present. But now what I would want you to do is to uh, focus on someone, you know, who has been successful. Don't focus on the people who haven't. Don't focus on the complainers. So I think that you might know that my mother is my shero. So my mother quit her job. Now, listen to this. In 1982, she was a dietitian to mm-hmm. go and sell hot dogs in the park. Mm-hmm. She had a 1968 Plymouth that she pulled this food truck with. And my mother essentially sold hot dogs until she relocated to St. Louis. Mm -hmm. It afforded, she made substantially more money selling these hot dogs in the park. But my mother was relentless about her occupation, her hustle, and how she was going to do it her way. So I was I had the the front seat to seeing somebody do this. So I have an old video that says uh, dope fiend mentality. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we start thinking about being in business, we have to have a dope fiend mentality. So I don't know if you've Mm -hmm. ever known a drug addict, but they're going to get that narcotic no matter what. Right. And every single day they getting up and they going to scheme on a way on how they going to facilitate their high for the day. Mm-hmm. That's how we have to be about real estate. We, we you have to have because a dope fiend, you ain't telling him he ain't getting high. So we talking uh-huh. about a person who's irrational. Right. Who often could also be homeless. Right. Who got all kind of ain't paid a light bill, a gas bill and don't have a penny saved up. And they're going to figure that out. We can figure this out. And so I'm not saying that there's no fear that comes with it. I think that you Mm -hmm. should focus on everybody who get what they want and how they overcome that and make that more of the focal point versus the fear. And then if church is open, you got to you go go to church. If you pray, go to church and pray on it. Um, I do all of it to try Mm -hmm. to put myself in a position That when fear comes, I'm already so built up Mm -hmm. that I shut it down. So staying heavy on the affirmations, heavy on the prayers, um, heavy on the visualization, heavy on watching the movie The Secret, right? All of Mm -hmm. these different things. And then if you haven't done the landmark form, I would recommend that that might be an investment that you make. Um, The landmark form shows up in my life all the time 
and um, overcoming fears, calling a thing a thing, you know, is kind of how I put it. But I am a graduate of the the landmark form. So I've invested heavily in um, education and programs to okay. be shored up. OK. Landmark form. Landmark okay. form. It's I think I don't know. It was 875 when I went through it. Some people will tell you it appears to be coat like it. Let me say this. They're a unique group of people. Um, it's not cult like, but it is definitely a mindset that any and everything you want, you can have it. So people who work at Lululemon, they make sure all their team goes through there. And I don't know if you like when you go on Lululemon, like they're going to help you, honey. And if they don't have that sage pants and that style you want, they showing you 10 other styles of sage pants. Right. Because they're going to figure it out because they need to sell you a pair of pants to help you in your workout. So you may not get what you came to get, but you're going to get a pair of these here pants. Right. Yeah. Um, and a lot of other uh, big companies, and I don't know if, if Lulu is a, a Fortune 500 or not, but I'll tell you this, my uh, son, Skyler, I sent him mm-hmm. through the teen form and there's parts of his life that keep showing up. So imagine he's 25, a broker, uh, a consultant at Accenture, Howard Business Fraternity Fraternity. It's you, you know. You know, mm-hmm. but I see Landmark show up. Mm -hmm. And so that might be worthwhile, the investment, if it gets you to a place to overcome any doubt of your capabilities of being successful as an entrepreneur. And you might need to change your sphere of influence. How many of your friends, when you think about who you spend your most time with, not Mm -hmm. we all got our real estate friends. I'm talking about the friends outside of real estate that you spend time with. Are they entrepreneurs? Not not all. Not all. Okay. so what you want to do is make I'm not saying all of your friends have to be entrepreneurs. It's a lot easier when the majority of your friends are entrepreneurs because Mm -hmm. there's a different mentality and mindset. Mm hmm. Right. And because real estate often also is lonely. Right. Mm -hmm. Isolating. You have to put yourself around other people who support the ideas and help your creativity uh, unleash. So uh, I have friends that are not in real estate, but I have so many real estate friends Mm -hmm. that on any given day, I can call three, four people Mm -hmm. and we can just talk about real estate. I do have that. Okay. So, but, but even when you go out for your, your cocktails or your drinks, right, you have to do that. So I'll give you a, another example outside of business. Um, at the time that I was getting married, a lot of my friends were going through a divorce because I got married late, right? And it might appear that I did not support them uh, in their divorces, right? Mm-hmm. Well, they were negative. They were hating me at this point, right? And I didn't found this dude. I think I might marry him. And I'm like, look, I, I'm over here in a good situation. Right. And I don't want to throw this good situation up in your face. And I don't want to hear that negativity to taint how I'm feeling about my relationship. Right. Same thing comes down when it comes to hanging out with entrepreneurs. Yeah. You got to shore up. You got to have you some friends and some support groups where you have people in real estate or just entrepreneurs, period. They don't have to be in real estate. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for especially the, the, the mustard seed and the, and the affirmations and just that faith. That faith. That faith. And yeah, and talking nice and that. positive Dope to yourself. Fame mentality. That's going to go. Dope fame mentality. I got a full fledged Facebook live video on dope fame mentality. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and the reason is, my mother was great, but my mother, uh, when I went away to college, my mother started using a drug called uh, Karachi, which is a synthetic form of heroin. Both of my parents were heroin addicts at the same time. So first of all, I had to dig real deep inside of myself because I'm dealing with it. I'm dealing with plum fools, right? Mm-hmm. They were fools. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell you where the Dauphine mentality came from. My mother, I had a three flat building. My mother lived on the second floor. I lived on the third floor. And I had a habit of keeping my 
door open because it was a family uh, building. My grand, one of my grandfathers lived on the first floor. My cousin lived in the basement. But my other grandfather had sold me the building that was in an irrevocable trust to my mother. So my mother had to sign off on the building being sold to me. But what it did ensure my mother that she was going to always have a roof over her head if I had this building. Mm -hmm. So I came out of my kitchen and I noticed my mother walking out my front door. And I'm like, where was she up in my house for? And it hit me. Go check your money. And I went to go check my money. And some of my money was missing. So I go to the front window to yell out the third floor, bring me my money back. And my mother tells me, wait a minute. And she proceeds to walk off. That means she's going to get high. Mm -hmm. When she came home 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, I'm like, I, I need my money and I need it right now. Or I'm calling the police. I'm having you arrested and I will evict you. You will get out of jail and your stuff will be sitting on the curb. I said, I'm done playing with you. And I was I was a, a tough parent to my parents. So my mother sat at her ten thousand dollar burn heart, whatever dining room set because she had made a lot of money so she i mean she living good this looked like something out of one of those hollywood movies right she got uh ten thousand dollar rugs in her house but she getting high all right and <laughs> this is insane so my mother sits at her ten thousand dollar dining room set and rolls me twenty dollars worth of pennies to give me back the twenty dollars she had taken out of my bag that is where dope fiend mentality comes from. To see your mother sit at her dining room table and roll you $20 worth of pennies for getting high. Yeah. Dope fiend mentality. And that's just one of numerous incidents <laughs> that I experienced over my life. My father's always been an addict and my mother uh, got high for 15 years. She got clean and then three years later passed away from a brain aneurysm. So I seen it. Even though I saw her quit her job and when she did the yellow wagon and all that, she wasn't getting high. So I saw that and then I saw like relentless Hazel. Baby, bye. if you got a dope fame mentality, you can do anything. So I don't want you to I don't want nobody to go get high. OK, okay. but I just want you to have the, the 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 mentality because it's a different mindset. And you're not telling no Dauphine, no, period. Hook no. or crook, they will figure it out. Thanks for that. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, I, I knew I needed to go a little deeper than to paint this vision. Oh, no, no. <laughs> look, and then this, this is the funny part. She had the goal to have an attitude. I said, I wish you, she, I mean, she rolling them and she mad. You gonna have an attitude, you stole my money. Look, look, roll them damn I mean, pennies faster. That's for me. I'm sorry. Girl, yeah, I'm look, sad. 20, I had $20 and rolled pennies because she did try to give me like the whole jug of pennies i'm like oh hell no that will not work i want my 20 dollars back <laughs> See, then i went down there and agitated i'm like <laughs> roll fast <laughs> wrong just all wrong okay all so wrong. Th yeah i think uh, you got the idea <laughs> so my second question um so you see realtors that make that struggle but don't make really any money and then you have realtors is making like half a million dollars you know what what do you why do you think that is why do you think some make less some make more what are those qualities and skills that make a six-figure agent a six-figure agent I'm, let's talk about I, I talk often times about three things that I think people need right when you're looking mm -hmm. at your business plan we need to look at price point we need to look at rate of sale we need to look at barriers to entry okay which often is not talked about. When I'm looking at our most successful agents in my marketplace, oftentimes they have a different level of access. Okay. Right. So that comes with barriers to entry. And I've seen agents come into the business who 10 years ago didn't even speak English. Mm, okay. Yeah. So 
the mindset is definitely one. The mm-hmm. fact that there is no option. Like they're going to make this work regardless. OK. And the fact that I definitely believe they have uh, systems based on a business plan. So when we look at there are two women in the Chicago land area, they're both platinum level realtors consistently do over 100 million dollars a year. What nobody really talks about is that both of them are married to men who have predictive analytics companies. Okay. Their spouses are sharing with them the probability of something closing between zero and one, like a remind, right? So those two would be Jennifer Ames and Emily Sachs Wong. Emily Sachs Wong husband owns at properties and they own a predictive analytics tool. And then Jennifer Ames's husband has his own company. And so wait a minute, did I say Jennifer? Yeah, Jennifer Ames. I gotta get them right. Uh Amy. Emily Sachs Wong and Jennifer Ames. And so they understand their numbers. They also are very involved in the community that they serve. Um, When it comes to volunteering, when it comes to uh, philanthropy, they're doing it all right there. So one of the bigger mistakes that I think I see agents uh, make is the fact that they want to service everyone and be everywhere. Because when I'm telling you about these women, because they have this tool, their goal is to earn the most amount of money per hour with the fewest hours vested. So they're looking at that rate of sale. They're looking at that price point. And they, they don't have the barriers to entry. First of all, because they've gone and successfully opened all doors through the chamber, through sitting on the board of directors for the biggest hospital in the community. So when you start thinking about this area, I definitely want you to look at price point, the rate Mm -hmm. of sale and the barriers to entry. When you are creating your business plan, because some of us want to be successful and we want a level of success that we would never get where we currently are. Mm-hmm. True. Question about community involvement. What do you say to the dual agent that doesn't even have time to really do anything else? You know what I mean? Um, so I would want to go back and look at the schedule and see why you think you don't have time to do anything else. And then I would say a part of the time that you are contributing to real estate, you should take some of that to be more involved in the community, because essentially you could be you could work with one organization and it could be your whole funnel. OK, OK. Um, Shay Hada would probably be she's done some. Oh, where was Shay Hada? I interviewed her. Um, so Shay Hada is married to, he used to be the director of engagement for the National Association of Realtors. He is now the, no Buhada. He is now the CEO, thank you, of the Denver Associ- Denver Metro Association of Realtors. But his wife is a top producer who is now, <laughs> listen to this, they have like a three or four year old. She's in Denver with him, but she telecommutes to Chicago with her real estate team and how much did they do? She does a lot. She, I think she does maybe 40 million, 40, 60 million, 40 to 60 million dollars a year in sales. She does not believe in cold calling, direct mail, none of it. Everything she's done has been based on uh, a few groups. One she created, one she joined, and all her leads are coming from these groups. So my career would not be where it is had I not volunteered. Okay. It's no, so key, yeah. Mm-mm. Okay. And so the key is to find an organization. Don't stretch yourself with doing too much. <clears throat> Just find your place in, in that. Find a place. It might be an education organization, a parent, or, a parent education organization, because now you can provide educational benefit in addition to real estate, and it'll be a natural fit. Oh, okay. Think about that. Okay. Thank you. What business-related books have, have inspired you the most? 
Oh, I think I talk about them all the time. Um, the one thing, okay. um, the miracle morning. Uh, eat that frog. This is not business related, but I would say the secret. So all them big old books that's up there at the top, I didn't read most of them. So if, if it's a huge book, I need them to give me some simple get to the, I need them to get to the point. Or else I ditch, d- detach from the book. So all the other books that everybody else, you know, probably the big old ones and all that. No, nah, I would need to, re- I would need to listen to that on Audible. Um, but I like small, quick reads with simple things to implement. I'm gonna be honest with you. The one thing changed, changed everything. So in 2012, I was worn out. I was the queen of foreclosures. <clears throat> it was, um, it was depressing. Like if I heard one more sad story and I picked up the social media and technology and I read the one thing and I, I decided that I would get even more focused and that I was not going to do the foreclosures and short sales, which had been my bread and butter for the past eight for essentially had been for the past four years since about 2008. So I just said I would focus. And when I started talking exclusively about social media and technology, I was actually ahead of myself and I actually made the least amount of money in 2012. And every year since then, financially, I've earned more money. But that one thing and then eat the frog. So the reason I think you should read Eat the Frog is because you can have it all. You just can't have it at the same time. So it's not a matter of what you're going to say yes to. It's really a matter of what you're going to say no to. Okay. Thank you. So you... We talked about community involvement. You talked about lead generation as being like those key activities that we need to be doing. We need to be investing our time in. What else, what other activities, key activities would you suggest that that we should be doing? So definitely lead generation and volunteering. But I think that with your lead generation and your volunteering, You have to be very strategic. So when it comes to volunteering, because I see people all the time who over volunteer and they aren't making any money. You do not want to be that volunteer. So there is a balance. So you want to find exactly how much time you want to dedicate. I'll give you a prime example. When NAR decided that they were going to launch their mentorship program, the email they sent out, because I think it's only eight, six or eight associations that are participating in this inaugural program, they asked for uh, a 20 hour per month um, dedication. I'm like, oh, I instantly email my CEO. I'm like, there's absolutely no way I have 20 hours a month to give. So she went back to NAR. She said, that's a consistent complaint. I'm like, we can find a few hours a week, but you're talking about five hours. That's a half of a day. No, that ain't gonna happen. And so they changed the requirements to eight to 10 hours, which we all can rearrange our time and uh, come up with that time. And so you always want to look at your calendar before you commit, because you don't want to show up as the non-coordinator, always last minute volunteer. You want to be that intentional, always there, maybe stopped and picked up donuts, volunteer. The reason volunteering has helped me so much is because Chicago is such a racially segregated city. So now Mm -hmm. the black folks know me and the white folks know me, the Asians know me, the Hispanics know me because of my volunteering, because we're in the trenches together. But I was even more intentional than that. So when I first went on the board of directors back in 2006 of the Chicago Association of Realtors, I would arrive at my meet my board meeting early and I would put my stuff on the table. But I already knew who I wanted to sit next to because that means Mm -hmm. that I could lean over and have a little conversation. Mm -hmm. So I knew my questions and who if it was going to be Stephen Baird, who uh, is the owner of Chicago's oldest real estate company, Michael Golden, who owns at properties, because, all you know, you got the heavy hitters. Right. So this is what I would do when they'd come in and set their billfold down. I'd go set my billfold. I'd move my little stuff right next to them. And then I would say, oh, we sit next together today. Can I get you some coffee? Mm-hmm. 
Right. And I've had uh, Sheldon Good, who used to own one of the top auction companies in the world. I had to laugh about this. I had him walking down Michigan Avenue carrying my briefcase after me. So it, the volunteering goes a long way. And I do it. I'm hospitable. Would you like another bagel? Oh, let me go get that for you. Because, baby, I'm going to give me $10,000 worth of advice sitting in this chair. (laughs) Yeah, the least I could do is go get you a bagel and refill your coffee. Right. Right. Okay. That's good. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, Where am I? Okay. So I, you, you you talked about your career and you're, you're going from uh, being a loan officer to an agent. I want to ask you, if you had a chance to start your business over, what, if anything, would you do differently? Hmm. I don't think I would have did much differently because the reason I pivoted from being a loan originator to a realtor was based on the numbers. I had that business plan. It told me that I would have to originate 141 loans to earn $240,000 based on my split. I knew if I did 141 loans that my child would never see me, right? Mm -hmm. I pivoted to real estate sales where I could earn more per transaction and I only did 70 transactions, I actually earned $2,000 more. So that was a strategic move. Uh, I've been quick to implement the advice that was given to me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm not, I think, I think I'm where I'm supposed to be. I would have maybe implemented some of my strategic partnerships sooner. So I would have asked earlier if it was one thing and what do I mean by ask? An example would be I'm uh, just signed agreement with the Real Estate Business Institute and I have agreements with homes.com. Mm-hmm. Each one of those agreements, y'all always ask me a question where I'm going to tell the damn business. So how did I even end up in an agreement with homes.com? Okay, um, because I'm only their third secret speaker uh, in the history of their secret events, which is a, a long running event. When we go to the Realtor Conference and Expo, I am infamous for having the best items waiting for me because I DM them before we get to the conference. I'll reshare some of their content and ask them if they could save an item for me. Yes. So the best T-shirts, whatever the best items are at the conference, I'm going to get them because I had already communicated and asked for them. <laughs> So this is the ask. So when homes.com, they have their webinars and they reached out uh, for me to do a webinar. Now, let me just tell you the value. You have to know when to do something for free. okay? but then you have to ask. So I was invited to do a webinar. I already knew it was one of their top webinars. So not only do I ask them for the T-shirt, which we were in Boston, I believe they had these T-shirts that were running out fast. I'm like, could you hold me one of them T-shirts? They like, yeah. I'm like, I'm your webinar speaker. They like, okay. When I get there, one of their uh, VPs is there. I slide up on her and I said, so what else can I do with Mm homes.com? And that's when I signed a national agreement with them. But I did the webinar first and showed up and showed out to be able to come back and ask. When it comes to the Real Estate Business Institute, I've uh, worked pretty much with all of these entities under NAR. I've taught all their designations and certifications. So I already knew who I wanted to work with based on how aggressive I think the organizations are. So I slid, I slid up into the CEO's uh, inbox. I said, I think we should do ABCD. And she agreed to it. She said, well, funny, you should ask, Marky. Your name, it came up for someone for me to reach out to. But I still reached out first. So whatever you want to develop, you want a certain client, ask for it sooner. You already have all the skills you need to acquire it. I'll let you say you guys talk about being intentional. Being very intentional. And 
I definitely don't believe the closed mouths get fed. So I don't know if Carrie has uh, hopped on, but I'm gonna give you a situation with Carrie. Carrie was hot as a firecracker because somebody was doing something with our state. And she was like, they didn't pick me, right? And I said, well, I we both know the person. I said, Carrie, you think they just picked that person? They reached out to them and asked them to do that? And she was like, yeah. I said, absolutely not. I said, why would they just reach out to that person? I said, they didn't reach out to that person. I said, that person called, emailed them and asked them for that business. I said, if you so offended, go ask for it. She went mm-hmm. and asked for it. They gave it to her. So it's kind of like, yeah, because never assume, right? So every last one of these deals, I'm not waiting. First of all, let's level up for me. So I better go ask for it. Okay. So if you want to know how I get these opportunities, some of them definitely they're strategically, you know, selecting me and doing it. But right. I, I'll do something for you to get visibility and then right. come back and ask. So I always come from contribution. I pray on every engagement because I need to knock them out. Once I do my good job, then I come back and I ask. Thank you. Yes, the leading with value and contribution. That's like my, that's right up here on my wall too. Le- give them something. Yeah. Okay, last question. Last? Have, you done? You last done? Yeah, that last one. We kind of answered one of the other ones I was going to ask. Them. Okay, I'm, I'm checking. On that one. So, what has been your most satisfying moment in business? My most satisfying moment in business is actually this year. Okay. Um, to be able to pivot. Because mm-hmm. what people really still have not acknowledged is I'm gainfully unemployed from my primary source of income. I'm a keynote speaker. I'm used to being on a stage. Mm-hmm. I will not be on a stage standing in front of a room until August. Do I make money? Yeah, I make money every single day. But these are new expanded streams of income. That wasn't what I was doing. OK. So to be able to pivot, to be able to net more money mm-hmm. than I've ever netted making less money. Mm-hmm. Operating at a 65% profitability. So that means I'm being a good servant and diligent with the earnings. But here's the kicker. The fact that I paid the IRS in full. So let me tell you how important that is. When my husband asked me to get married on June the 3rd, 2006, I said, look, before I marry you, and we got married on June the 6th, I said, I need to come clean. I said, me and the IRS don't have a good relationship. I said, I owe them money right now. I said, and I don't know when I'm going to get straight with them, so I need to let you know this right now. I said, now I'm going to pay that state tax every year on time because I'm going to keep every last one of these licenses. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to play with that IRS. (laughs) Here's what's crazy. I paid the IRS, but didn't submit the 2019 taxes, but I ain't sent them their money. Like the money sitting there and they like, who, what, what tax return we attach this to? The joy I had a month ago, paying them for every year I owed them and still had money in the bank was satisfying. So what you, what I've told myself is I could pivot. Mm-hmm. I can develop all these other streams of income. I can operate at a high profitability mm-hmm. and that I don't need to make as much money as I think I do to net what I want to net. To and me, you are on stage, by the way. Huh? This is not, you are on stage. I know, but it's not this, you know, like this is a modified ah, stage. You know, they ain't used to, I'm used to having sad shay. I got walks and pauses and stuff, right? So, yeah, this is my new state. Um, and so the opportunity, <laughs> I would say, is satisfying. The second one, right, would have been when I got that email from the National Association of Realtors in 2009 to speak at my very first realtor conference and expo. And here's why. 
In 2006, my grandfather died from Alzheimer's disease. I had my third bout of pneumonia. It covered 70% of my left lung. They wanted to hospitalize me. I begged the doctor to just send me home. Um, My mother died from a brain aneurysm. Now, this is all back to back. I got married June the 6th, pregnant July the 4th, fainted on an airplane in September, went to go see the psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist would not treat me, he said, because I was not suffering from depression. However, after my grandfather had died, my mother died, <clears throat> and I had pneumonia. When I got married on June the 6th, I went to Las Vegas on June the 14th to attend the Real Estate Education Association Conference. <clears throat> Terry Watson was there, and he was teaching a class, Harnessing the Power, from the Women's Council of Realtors, which has a lot to do with mindset. In that class, I wrote down on a sheet of paper, I'm going to be like Terry Watson, and I'm going to speak at the Realtor Conference and Expo. In that class, he said, don't worry about the how, just claim it. I still don't know how we got from 2006 to 2009. It was it's all the fall, right? I don't even talk much about that era. That's how foggy it was in my life. I was just kind of um, out here in life, right? Because I was, I was mentally disconnected, okay? But when that email showed up, I cried like a baby because what I had wanted had manifested itself and I don't know how it manifested itself. All I know is that on June the 14th in Terry Watson's class, I wrote it down which comes back to the reason why you should have your affirmations. That's all I know. So, so from the moment I wrote it down till three years later, I can't tell, I don't know what happened. It reminds me of that story that Jim Carrey talked about, about the $10 million check he wrote to himself or something and he carried it with him. Um, and then he got the, his first $10 million uh, opportunity. Look deal. Yeah, he always yeah. had that check he wrote as a, you know, affirmation, speaking that this is going to happen and it did. So you got to most definitely keep pictures around, keep your vision board. There's a young lady, she does a vision board party, but she set smart goals around everything on the vision board. Mm-hmm. You Another know, the thing that I, 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 I record, I've recorded like affirmations into my phone and I play it in the morning on my drive to work, affirming myself as a business owner and you know what I what my goals are so that's been that's been helpful to me too so but yeah. being scared I, I'm gonna be I, and you're gonna get scared more let me be clear but just you know uh I, I get every opportunity right doing it scared I'm doing it scared I'm scared but I'm still doing it yeah just keep keep doing it um and just take little steps but keep moving in the right, right. keep moving in the direction of what you want And probably the last thing I would say, which some of you have heard before, and that is the fact that I am in my house. People think I work too much. Right. So they always Mm -hmm. talk about how much I work. However, Mm -hmm. they already know I'm only going to listen to that nonsense for so much. The same way you think that I work too much and I go too hard. There's an opposite to that. It's called don't do enough. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to sit around here and call y'all lazy, listless bums. Pick it, Mm -hmm. pick your effort up. And you're not going to tell me I work too much. Because it's definitely an opposite of don't work. It work too much. Don't work enough. Okay, so I'm not picking on them to make them pick their pace up. Don't try to slow me down. And it works like a charm because don't nobody want to be called lazy and don't nobody want to pick their pace up <laughs> no, no, they don't. no they don't they don't <laughs> oh well that's that's all i got marky that's all you oh. got what well, you know what that's not all I got. that was a lot that was like if you say so questions child <laughs> Look, and look, I see you with your videos and everything, but here's some of the things people had to say. They said, do it afraid. That's Kenya. Hey, Kenya. Scared is part of it. And uh, let me say this. Uh, 
what she said, June 14. Hey, that's my anniversary. That's a powerful day. I'm telling you right now. Um, Born to be Exceptional by Steve Morris uh, is awesome, too. The worst uh, someone can do is say no to you. Uh, busy, note taken. Thanks for the questions, Kelly. Kelly, you are doing great being yourself and being vulnerable in front of us. Great stuff. Kenya stated that she is reading The One Thing and Atomic Habits. Love that as well. Uh, Tammy stated she is reading The Tipping Point. Oh, I love, you know what? I love The Tipping Point too. Yep. So, to, so let me tell you one of the reasons why, uh, oh, the 10, uh, 10X rule is also great. And The One Thing is great. But what I got out of The Tipping Point for me is that I'm probably doing too much because I am trying to tip myself into something different, right? So essentially, how do how do you get over there, right? So you want to go and you want to read uh, the tipping point. That's another good one as well. So I do the absolute most because I'm trying to tip over into the next being era. I think that's the concept. It's the tipping point and another one. It's the tipping point. No, that ain't it. Which book talks about when soccer players are born and the reason kids born, I think, in January and February. Uh, outliers. So, yeah, the tipping yeah. point is the one I was saying. I like outliers, uh, too, and the tipping point. Thank you, Tamika. Yeah, you knew exactly which one Got I was talking about. Thank you. Thank you all. Somebody wanted to know who is the author of Tipping Point. It's like uh, four of them. If y'all could drop that down into the chat. Oh, Malcolm uh, Gladwell. Tamika's own these books. Come through, Tamika. Yes. Well, guys, I want to thank you for being here this evening.